Welcome to another in the series of virtual heritage walkabouts from Kirkcaldy Civic Society. Uh, this one covers uh, quite a considerable territory. It covers the Seafield, Inverteel and Lincoln areas of Kirkcaldy, or more correctly, uh, if this was the 19th century, I should have said Lincoln of Abbots Hall. Um, almost uh, none of this territory was part of the Royal Borough of Kirkcaldy until 1876, and indeed quite a considerable chunk of this was actually part of Kinghorn Parish. But we'll explain some of the details of that as we're going through the walk. Okay, so where is our walk going to commence from? Well, it commences from the set of traffic lights on a busy Kirkcaldy intersection of actually five roads. The main two roads are the road which is an ancient road from Kinghorn to Kirkcaldy and also Inverteel Road which takes you out to Oric Quarry and indeed at one time was called the Queen's Ferry Passage Road and also the road down to the Esplanade. There is a fifth road, it's blocked off now, which is called Sinclair Terrace. Just before we start out, a couple of things. First of all, uh, a nice piece of urban art is right at the set of traffic lights. Very, very pleasant. And the second item, if you look at this old Ordnance Survey map, what you see on it is a feature which uh, almost entirely has now been obliterated. That was the Seafield Rail branch line from the main line, which of course is the London to Aberdeen line. This particular line was branch line was built to take coal from the Central Five coal field in the 19th century to a harbour, a pier, which we will see later in the talk. Only fragments of both the railway structure and the pier still remain, but we'll see that as we go round the walk. Okay, we're just about to take off in the Seafield direction. Just as a bit of background though, there has been coal rot from a variety of different holes in the ground over many, many decades, indeed centuries. But very significantly, there was a very large colliery in the site, Seafield Colliery. There was a ceremony for the cutting of the first sod to mark the shaft sinking a way back on the 12th of May 1954. The idea being that coal was going to be mined deep under the Firth of Forth. At one time, Seafield Colliery had in excess of 2,400 employees and indeed was one of Scotland's super pits with, the output, with an output of more than one million tonnes of coal per year. Like most pits, of course, it did have its disasters and the main one was back in May of 1973, indeed the 10th of May, when five miners lost their lives in a roof fall. Regrettably, the pit itself, after a major fire, stopped producing coal, and indeed the last coal was produced on Friday the 22nd of January 1988. The final photograph shows the demolition of one 
of Seafield's winding towers, and that took place in September 1989. And in many people's estimations, part of Kirkcaldy's industrial decline took place once the pits closed in this area in the late 1980s. Our first feature on the walk itself pertains back to this old obliterated railway line, so let's just quickly recap on that. Uh, you can see from the map that the branch line branched from the main line and indeed goes through a tunnel, uh, of which we have a photograph, then along a green strip uh, beside Inverteal Road. It went underneath Inverteal Road and then along the line of what is currently Peebles Street and then went under another tunnel under uh, Kinghorn Road uh, right beside, the, on the left-hand side of the buildings that you see. If we glance across the road from here, we see quite a prominent building. This building has been a number, has had a number of different functions over the years, but at one time it was the manse for links free church, and we'll pass that later in the walk. On this map, you see a small green dot. This is where we have re now reached, and we are just about to enter the confines of Seafield Housing Estate, which of course was the housing estate which replaced Seafield Colliery after it had been demolished. And Seafield Estate is a pretty sizeable estate, as you can see from the map itself. Our next feature is one of Kirkcaldy Civic Society's plaques. This plaque commemorates Seafield Colliery, and indeed is on the site of the North Winding Tower. Uh, it is located uh, beside a small uh, play area in Bow House Drive. As we are sauntering through the uh, new Seafield Estate, uh, can I take this opportunity to commend uh, another facility which is being developed uh, in conjunction with the Civic Society's virtual uh, heritage walkabouts, and that is uh, the work which is being done by Alec uh, Donald uh, from Kirkcaldy Rumblers, who is working on um, actual heritage walks and indeed he is working on one for this particular walk as well. And that will be available on um, View Ranger app uh, and website uh, in the very near future as well. And uh, I will make further reference to that at the end of the walk. The actual walk takes you through the Seafield Estate and out of its south end along a path which takes you along beside the main railway line and then by a short uh, path onto the main uh, Fife coastal path at which point you double back and eventually finish back at where you see in the picture Seafield Tower. This tower was built around 1540 by a member of the Moultrie family of Seafield and Markinch. 
It was originally surrounded by a boundary wall which had lookout towers. The ground floor was vaulted and the upper floors reached by a spiral staircase. There would have been three floors topped by an attic. There was a well close to the tower where a spring can sometimes be seen today. Uh, but this particular tower has a lot of history in terms of its various residents. But by 1790 it was described as a ruin, which of course it is today as well. And of course it is very sad that no one is concerned with any conservation of this tower or other similar ones in the Kirkcaldy area, for example the tower at Bulgiri. They all form part of Kirkcaldy's rich heritage and story. The next graphic is a very interesting one. Uh, the top part, of course, is a representation of Seafield Tower, but the bottom one actually continues part of our previous story. As it says, the Seafield Harbour and Dock. Uh, this was a representation of what the harbour that was only partially built in as much as the pier was built, uh, which we had been discussing earlier in terms of this was the part which was the end of the Seafield sea branch line. And the idea was that uh, coal would be uh, exported from this fine harbour. The reality of the situation was that it was never built in, in completion. And uh, the reason for that was basically that one railway company realising that it was going to lose a lot of business bought out the other railway company and of course the work on this dock ceased from that point. This picture of course shows the very few fragments of the pier which are now left and that is something like 130 years from when it was built. We continue our walk along the Fife Coastal Path in the direction of Kirkcaldy uh, and our next location is the modern picnic area at Seafield Beach. This particular picture of course shows what it looked like uh, in the 1920s. Uh, even then, it was also a popular place for bathing, and indeed, it was probably Kirkcaldy's best beach, as well as uh, uh, ancillary uh, leisure facilities very close by the beach as well. But of course, being an industrial Kirkcaldy, you also see a big chimney in the picture as well. We continue out of the picnic area, still heading north along the coastal path, and the next building we see is our rope works. Um, this was called locally as the ropery. Uh, ropes were extremely important uh, for uh, sailing ships and for the hoisting of goods uh, and a whole lot of other purposes. At one time Kirkcaldy had no less than four rope works. Uh, the, uh, the actual building itself of course has now been demolished and of course has now been replaced by Morrison's car park. But it was a very familiar site for over a hundred years uh, in this area. On the opposite side 
of the coastal path from the Ropery, uh, there was a Lido, an outdoor seawater swimming pool, and that was built in 1936 by a Mr Swanson uh, on the site of an old chemical works. Uh, it closed during the war years, but opened for a short time after that and finally closed in 1953. It then became Alma Confectionery, which made popular sweets like skull crushers. The work was transferred to Dundee in 1991 and closed in 1995. The empty building went on fire and was demolished. From here we proceed along the prom and we come to the Teal Burn and indeed the Teal Bridge which uh, spans it. If you look very closely at the picture then you can see a substantial girder. It is reputed that that girder uh, came from the old Tay Bridge and was brought here by cart after the Tay Bridge had crashed into the Tay. This is the old bridge, of course, in December 1879. Behind that, you see buildings which have been subsequently demolished, but in that area there were three bus stations which were originally built by Alexander's the first two were built in 1933 and the last one was built in 1938. The site of course has now been flattened and we await uh, developments. From the Teal Bridge we take a quick glance along the prom from this point. Uh, the prom, of course, was properly constructed in 1922, having previously been called Sands Road. Uh, you can uh, tell um, that it is 1920s by both uh, the clothes which are, uh, individuals are wearing and by the horse and cart and uh, the bicycles. If we now double back to where Morrison's is now, uh, and we were to glance at the old maps, we would find this church. Uh, this church uh, was built as a chapel of ease, but be almost immediately become a Coad Sacra uh, parish church called the old Invertil parish church. It has to be remembered that every uh, part south of, immediately south of the Teal was part of the parish of Kinghorn. Uh, the idea of a chapel of ease was that people uh, had a church to go to much closer at hand than having to work every Sunday and back, of course, to attend church service in Kinghorn itself. Um, this uh, particular church was built in 1837. Uh, it was often called uh, Shuffle Katie's uh, Kirk because of the amount of um, weaving uh, houses and mills in this particular area. Uh, the church was eventually closed in 1952 and was used by Dennis Harper coach builders for a number of years and then it was later demolished and has been uh, um, several different retailers since, and of course now 
It is Morrison's. If from here we take the short walk up from uh, Morrison's, we finish up back at our start point again. Um, but you you will notice that the photo was taken in 2007. Uh, there are no traffic lights here at that time. Um, and the building uh, was called the Four Ways. Uh, subsequently, it was uh, demolished and was replaced with uh, modern flats, which are there just now. If we glance down the hill at this, this point, uh, this area is known as uh, Bridgeton. Uh, the, another few uh, bridges further down the hill. Um, the buildings that you see in the foreground, of course, have long since been demolished. Um, and uh, replaced by um, a car park and a garage. Uh, now instead of walking down Bridgeton uh, and uh, reaching a teal bridge at the bottom of the hill, we're going to we're going to go to another uh, teal bridge, an entirely different one. So we're going to walk back up Inverteal Road and cross the grass area, which is exactly where the Seafield Bridge line was. Uh, uh, after we've proceeded along uh, this area, we reach a viaduct, a railway viaduct, and a very uh, tall uh, railway viaduct, the Inverteal one. Um, we can uh, walk underneath uh, one of the piers and come down the other side. Uh, we come down the hill and we eventually arrive at the said Teal uh, Bridge, which is a largely a wooden structure. Regrettably, as you can see, vandals have been at it, and they have managed to burn part of the bridge. Uh, we proceed over the bridge, looking both sides uh, to the Teal Burn, and come out the other side. The Teal Burn, the name Teal comes from fast, fast flowing, so we are talking in terms of a fast flowing burn. Uh, and of course, in uh, over the many, many centuries, you made very good use of fast flowing burns, and very often what you did was you also built a lead, uh, and on uh, the leads you had various uh, mills. I mean, this is a highly uh, industrialised area over many centuries. Uh, various uh, 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 factories and mills have been in this area. Uh, uh, much more recently, there was a, a big dairy here. There used to be a uh, chemical works, um, and very close to the chemical works, there was a, a, a bleach field. Um, a wee bit further along, there was what was called West Mill, a flower mill. Um, yes, a hive of activity over many, many centuries. So that takes us to the end of the well named street called Mill Street and from this point we move down Pratt Street and we arrive at Bridge Street and again we arrive at yet another, another Teal Bridge. Uh, on the northern shore of the, the Teal, 
as you stand on the bridge. Um, there is a plaque, uh, a Civic Society plaque, to Robert Phelps Mill. Now, Robert Phelps is an in interesting character, uh, and we could produce a walk for him entirely, and we'll discuss more about Robert Phelps later on. In any case, uh, he had a mill on one side of the teal. On the other side of the teal, on the southern side of the teal, for many, many years, there was a brewery. Um, every town had at least one brewery uh, for the ale habits of the local inhabitants. As we stand on the Teal Bridge and we look uh, seaward and on the south side of the Teal, we see a very significant building with itself a rich heritage. Uh, this building is the West uh, Bridge Spinning Mill. Um, that, that is not to be accused, co uh, confused with the West Mill, which is on the other side of the road. Uh, this is very, very much, as it says on the tin, a spinning mill. Uh, this building was originally built by William Henry and his son Daniel uh, back in 1855. And in many respects, it was ahead of its time, both in terms of its architecture and also its technology. Um, it um, stayed as an industrial building over many, many years, uh, under different guises, until, regrettably, it was eventually closed in 1974. At that point, of course, it fell into dereliction. Uh, thankfully, though, uh, alternative use was found for it, uh, and an uh, excellent uh, renovation uh, job was done on the building. And it is uh, now um, run by Link Housing, uh, and that is for uh, homeless uh, young people and housing support needs. And also there is a bit which is the social enterprise side, which assists uh, small enterprises with office accommodation. But again, I reiterate, what one, it is wonderful that such a significant building has been saved for posterity. Okay, if we now go back down to the junction again at the Teal Bridge, uh, then we come, we, we are literally now in what is correctly called LinkedIn of Abbots Hall or the links. Uh, the building that you see on the uh, right hand side on the corner uh, was Stark's Bar which was of course a very popular hostelry over many many years uh, by both locals and Wraith Rover supporters given that Stark's Park is just up the hill a bit. Uh, another significance of this junction is that this was the terminus for Kirkcaldy's tram systems on the south side. Notice on the left hand side there are buildings which of course have long been demolished and there are sets of flats now on that site. As we start walking along the links, um, it's now of course called Link Street, but it actually at one time it was called the High Street, because indeed that was the High Street of uh, Linkton of Abbots Hall. Uh, one of the first buildings of significance that we come to is Stocks's Arden Works. Uh, 
uh, Stocks was a producer of linen for very, very uh, many years. Um, the actual works themselves have not entirely been demolished, but the works are much smaller than they used to be. The actual photograph you see here is of uh, workers inside the works itself. Opposite uh, Stocksies, which of course is now the carpet uh, warehouse, uh, we have a church. Uh, this church uh, wa uh, wa was Inverteel Free Church at one time, and again it was a product of the 1843 Church of Scotland disruption. Um, it, it took various names over time, um, as churches started to amalgamate again, etc. Uh, but eventually, the congregation of this church was amalgamated with Bethelfield Church, which we'll see later on in the walk, uh, into a single uh, church, with, uh, and the Inverteel Church became um, uh, surplus to requirements. Uh, it was taken over by the Coptic Christians and they have uh, resided here for uh, many years now as St Mark's Coptic Church. Uh, for those that, who have been fortunate enough to go inside it, and of course generally it's open in September for those open day, you'll find that, that inside it is a splendid uh, internal uh, church and also the congregation are extremely welcoming. So I commend that the next time that we have those open day. The links is very, very much a mixture of buildings. Uh, as we've already seen, we've got uh, factories, uh, we have churches, we have a lot of tenement buildings for workers, but also the owners, the 19th century industrialists, also built uh, quite fancy houses uh, in the links as well. And of course this picture is of the Lion's House, which, which was built by David Mervyn of the Potteries in the links in 1778. You can see in the back of the picture, you can see Inverteel Church. And indeed, what you can also see in the, in the picture is a bell tower uh, uh, for, uh, of um, the Lynx Church. The trouble is, though, it was so heavy that it actually quite quickly had to be demolished. Um, the the Lion House, Lion's House was so-called because of two lions, uh, which were on either side of the front door in begging position. Uh, the grounds of uh, the property stretched all the way down to Sands Road, but later on part of the ground at the bottom at Sands Road was sold off to Mitchell as an engineering works. The lines themselves were made, or more likely they were made, in Lincoln Pottery itself. Um, where they are now, uh, nobody absolutely knows, but it uh, is been, has been suggested that they are somewhere in Perthshire. These are not to be confused by the two lions which adorn uh, the front of the um, Wraith Gates Lodge uh, in Beveridge Park, although it is uh, true to say that these lions were also made in the Linktown Pottery. The Lion House itself was, just like so much of the links, was demolished around 1912, and it made way for the Linktown Co-op building. Of course, it's not true to say 
that the inhabitants of the links were all working in factories. Of course, of course they weren't. There was a whole lot of other service industries as well, including retail. Uh, so there's an example of a shop of which there were many small shops in the links uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, John Haig at the foot of uh, Methven Road. Um, I've already mentioned co-op buildings. Uh, of course, the co-op was a very, very important and popular retailer in areas such as the links. Opposite Methven Road, uh, there is a, a street which is now called Higgy's Wind. Uh, you can actually see what the original Higgy's Wine looked like uh, uh, from uh, Lynx uh, Street itself down to Sands Road. Um, what is being illustrated here is the fact that the Lynx was not simply just um, linen-based manufacture and potteries. There was a whole diverse range of industries in the area of which uh, one of them is dye works because you had to create dyes in order to colorize your cloth which you had just manufactured a wee bit further along the links uh, we come across a landscaped area um, and in that landscaped area we have on a wall a modern mural and that mural represents Sir Sanford Fleming uh, who is associated with um, World Time Zones, uh, Robert Adam who we'll speak about later who was designed in, uh, who was in, involved in architectural design and of course the world famous Lynx Market. Uh, a lot of work has been done, and I strongly commend the uh, Lynx he uh, Historical Group, who have been working extremely hard, uh, hard in uh, bringing to the fore so much of the Lynx's rich heritage uh, in this area, as well as um, some uh, plant pots. Uh, uh, offering the area some good colour. There are very, very good interpretation boards and I strongly recommend if you're walking along the links to take a chance to read these boards which contain valuable, important heritage information. At this point, we'll come back to discussing one of our top men, uh, whom I've already mentioned, Robert Philp. Uh, Robert Philp was a linen manufacturer who was born in Kirkcaldy in 1751 and died in 1828. In 1815, he bought the West Mill, which we have uh, discussed already, where he carried on spinning, weaving and bleaching, so more or less the full works. Uh, he was a bachelor, and his only brother had died young, and there was no one to whom he wished to leave his considerable wealth. So he set up a trust, and the money that was realised for that trust was in excess of £70,000, an amazing sum of money. He would have been, in today's terms, a multi-millionaire. But very, very particularly, the money was to be used for educating poor children. Subsequently, uh, schools were built in uh, Sinclairton and in Kirkcaldy and here in the links of which you see the photographs uh, of the school itself. Uh, he also bequested money for Kinghorn as well, which was he was also associated with for the education of 150 uh, Kinghorn pupils. 
uh, in these schools, uh, those who were funded by the Philp legacy were called Philippers and they, they wore a particular uniform to identify themselves. Uh, Robert Philp's own grave is a very large grave which is in Kirkcaldy Old Kirk Cemetery and is worthy of visiting as well. Okay, we're going to change the tone again. Um, let's uh, talk briefly about the governance of the area. Uh, after the uh, Reformation, in uh, around about 1560, uh, the, the lands, of course, at that time were owned by the uh, Abbey Church of Dunfermline, but, of course, things were about to change. And subsequently what happened was that the lands uh, which were previously church-owned were sold off to landowners. Uh, by the 1640s, uh, a, a gentleman from Edinburgh uh, called Ramsey who uh, became the landowner uh, of this particular patch of ground. And what was created was what was known as a borough barony. So it became properly called the borough barony of Lincoln of Abbots Hall. What a mouthful, but that was its Sunday name. Of course, landowners typically did not stay anywhere near the land that they owned, and of course, Ramsey was no different from that. Um, but he left a man in control, and that was a person called the Barn Bailey, and uh, the Barn Bailey had a house uh, in uh, the High Street of uh, the Links, uh, and also there was a toll booth. Um, the it's long since been demolished, of course, long since, but it was at the top of a wine called Bellwind, which, of course, itself has long since been demolished as well. So we have a number of um, photographs of both the site and also various commemorations that took place for that over the many years. Um, uh, there's a big story uh, uh, associated with uh, the Barn Bailey and how he run, went about running uh, law, order, etc, etc in the links and we may expand on that sometime in the future as well. I take it that you did note the clock in the previous photograph. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, uh, next, uh, uh, photographs indicate um, uh, views along uh, the links. Um, notice the um, four stairs, which were very, very common in the 18th and 19th centuries, and of course eventually became um, obstructions and of course staircases then tended to move inside um, but very very pertinently what you see is a very important part of the links which was the tram system which was part of Kirkcaldy Corporation's tram system so we see a photograph of the tram line and indeed a photograph of a tram which is passing along Link Street. Um, the clock, as I referred to before, uh, was an important part, of course, because people generally did not have uh, watches at that time, and therefore uh, you have a prominent uh, clock where people can tell the time uh, and know when tra trams were due along. And indeed, there was also what was known as a Bundy clock, uh, which was used for timing purposes as well. Uh, the tram system started in Kirkcaldy in 19, uh, 
was O3 and was uh, wound up in 1931. But people from other bits of, uh, bits of Kirkcaldy could travel to their work, to their factories, etc., etc., doing the links. And, of course, people from the links could travel to other bits of Kirkcaldy as well, as far as the Galton and, of course, Dysart. OK. We change the theme again and we see one of the prominent houses uh, in the links. This particular one is Fourth Tower. Uh, th this house uh, was probably designed by either Robert Adam, who, who we'll discuss more uh, shortly, uh, or one of his brothers. Uh, their Edinburgh office opened in 1777 uh, and the, the house itself was built uh, in 1790 and it was built for a Robert Pratt of Glen Turkey. Yes, that Pratt is the same Pratt as Pratt Street. Um, Pratt himself was, um, uh, along with Heggie, a linen manufacturer in the links. Um, Pratt Street, of course, uh, was originally called Callaghy Bray, but its name was changed to commemorate Pratt himself. Um, Viewforth Tower uh, features many typical Adam features, especially curves. There was a round front porch, round stairs and a round tower. There were 14 rooms in the house, two of them round, and two with black marble fireplaces. Very, very much in the Adam style. Ah, a change of themes again. Back to industrial. Uh, we are at the foot of uh, Methern Road, which used to be called uh, Pottery Road. Uh, what we see uh, in the, the picture is the Linktown Pottery, which was originally set up in 1714 by William Robertson and William Adam, and originally it was for uh, brick and tile manufacturing. Uh, subsequently, uh, it was uh, it became under a David Medvin in 1776 uh, moved on to full scale pottery manufacture because there was a lot of quality uh, clay in the area which allowed that to be the case. Um, by the 19th century, pottery was absolutely booming. Uh, uh, and Kirkcaldy itself had uh, many other pottery works. Um, in addition to the works of which you see a photograph of, uh, then also uh, we have the buildings, the frontages as well, uh, one of which is extremely significant, and that is the um, Wraith Picture House, uh, the Wraith Picture House, which was uh, came into being in the 1930s and continued till the uh, early 1960s when it became a well-known, uh, nationally known, uh, Wraith Ballroom. And people came from uh, many parts of central Scotland to uh, dance uh, the night away. Um, we also have some of the um, pottery, some of which was high quality pottery, which was produced in the uh, pottery itself. Ah, theme change yet again. We're back to churches. Um, an interesting building. Uh, uh, this is the, or was, the Wraith Church. Again, it is a product of the 1843 disruption where a minister and part of the congregation would up sticks and move to a 
new place of worship. Uh, this was the product of such a disruption and it is in a very distinctive, or certainly the façade, very distinctive architectural style. Uh, the building, of course, has had several owners over the many years uh, since it ceased to be an actual church itself. Well, well, another change of theme, another change of angle, aerial view to start off with. Uh, what we see, of course, is more or less what the modern uh, prom or esplanade, or now called the waterfront, uh, looks like. Um, uh, the, building, the building of the uh, Esplanade took place in 1922 and uh, it had significance for a, a range of uh, things for the Kirkcaldy area, not simply just transport and one of them we are now going to touch on and that is what is known as is the Lynx Market. So our next set of photographs uh, cover some of the information about that, including some of the plaques in commemoration. Uh, the Lynx Market, of course, takes place now, uh, uh, roughly speaking, in the third week in uh, April of every year, and has changed uh, uh, over many, many years in terms of its content, but of course nowadays we're talking in terms of uh, a lot of the big uh, fair machines are now present. It is reputed to be, of course, the longest street fair in Europe, but its origins, of course, were in a um, charter which was given to Kirkori area back in 1304 by Edward I, who at that particular time uh, occupied uh, Scotland. It has since then, of course, had many, many manifestations and, of course, for a long time the actual market took place on Link Street, but then, of course, it moved to its current home on the um, Esplanade, um, um, in the late 1920s, early 30s, and has thrived uh, ever since then, regrettably, except to 20, of course, where it has been caught up with COVID-19. But let's hope in 2021 we get back to uh, more normal times and we have the Lynx Market, which is looked forward to by many children, both locally and further afield than that. And of course, when I refer to children, that's of course children of all ages, I am sure. Ah, we've now arrived at uh, the uh, Butewind area of the Lynx. Uh, Butewind itself was once called Abbot's Wind, then it was called Steam Loom Wind when there was a McDonald's linen factory there at one time. And then it became Bootwind, which became corrupted to Bootwind as um, Strachan Boot Factory occupied uh, part of the grounds of a house called Gladdy House, which we will now talk about very soon. Our famous Sun uh, is the theme this time. Uh, the, the photograph you see is of uh, Robert Adam. Uh, Robert Adam was a very famous uh, um, architect, uh, designer and house builder, some of extremely important repute. Um, the um, family themselves, the Adam family. His father was uh, William Adam, uh, who uh, was involved in the um, early pottery works in the town and had a house built called Gladney House, 
which was uh, in the grounds uh, very close to Butte Wind, which I have referred to. Um, the William Adam himself was a designer of buildings, an architect of some repute uh, in Scotland, but more importantly for our story is that uh, one of his sons uh, became internationally known um, with a very, very uh, particular style of architecture. Albeit, it has to be said, that uh, Robert Adams' own siblings uh, also were, uh, most especially James and John, were very good architects as well. Uh, Robert Adam himself was born in 1728, and he was born in Linktown. But uh, not that long after that, the Adam family debunked across to Edinburgh because it was more profitable for his father William to be operating out of Edinburgh. Uh, nevertheless, we will still have him as one of our famous sons. Uh, we undersell him considerably, and that is a project in its own right to put him back into his proper birthplace, uh, which of course is Kirkcaldy, and more particularly the Lynx. So watch this space on that one. You've seen a picture of Gladney House. Gladney House itself was demolished, like so many buildings of uh, substance. It was demolished in the 1930s, so it, it no longer exists. Where the plaque is, the plaque is in school wind, um, which is not quite exactly on the site of uh, where Gladney House was, but it's fairly close and it's easily accessible. Oops, uh, change of theme again. We've now reached um, uh, Gas Wind. Uh, uh, the significance of uh, this is that there was a large gas works located in this area, and that was first established in 1834. Uh, gas became, of course, very, very important in towns in the 19th century and of course everyone will have heard of gas street lighting um there was there was a very large uh, gasometer which of course you can see in the picture uh, that large gasometer was first removed by a smaller one in 1937 and then was entirely removed in 1981 and those of a particular age will remember when you went past it dare I say that you smelt uh, gas uh, as you were going along Back to more industry again, this time Lockhart's. Um, a Ninian Lockhart in 1797 came from uh, his farm up in Ubera and set up a small weaving business, business in Linktown, uh, close indeed to where this factory was. Um, the Lockharts, of course, came, became very important for a whole lot of different reasons in Kirkcaldy, uh, both the sons and also the grandsons. Um, what you will see from the photos, these series of five photos, is the frontage of the uh, factory, which of course is the offices, and then we see a number of photos of the actual works themselves, and then including a graphic uh, of the works, which was a considerable work. So now, and this works, of course, is on right on the edge of uh, LinkedIn, 
uh, and of course uh, bounds on Kirkconny itself because very close to this uh, burn, uh, flowed the Burley Burn which no longer exists now but it exists at that time because this brought brought the boundary of both Kirkconny and Lincoln together. So a very, very significant uh, works uh, this particular factory. Uh, this building up Milton Road uh, was originally the manse for Abbots Hall Church. Abbots Hall Church, of course, being a parish church. Since then, of course, it has been uh, several manifestations of a hotel. And nearly uh, opposite in Nicholl Street, we have a church which, when it was built, uh, was called Bethelfield Church. Uh, again, Bethelfield Church was born out of one of the many disruptions, not indeed the 1843 one, but an, an earlier manifestation of the disruption, disruptions which took place in the Church of Scotland. Uh, uh, as has been previously mentioned, uh, of course, uh, this was uh, part of an amalgamation with, uh, with the Lincoln Church, and this is the active church building now. Another wee story uh, related to Bethelfield Church on a slightly different side from this one, the previous church, was a certain Reverend Shira, uh, who was quite a character. Uh, I think that story will be left for a future version of this walk, though, but uh, well worthy of listening to. But we move on. The next story, and we're just about finished now, this is another story about uh, some degree of conflict between Lynx folk and Kirkcaldy folk. Um, Lynx, of course, was not, they did not become part of Kirkcaldy until 1876, quite a separate entity. But the Lynx folk were not happy about the cost of, um, of flour. Uh, not the cost that Kirkconny merchants were selling it at. So what Lynx folk did was they set up a separate Lincoln Bread Society and they bought their um, flour from elsewhere. They bought it mainly from across in uh, Edinburgh and it was shipped across from Leith. So that was uh, putting... Uh, a spoke in Kirkcaldy Merchants' uh, works uh, in terms of uh, that. Um, originally, the society had a premises further along the links, but they built a brand spanking new one at the foot of Bethelfield Place, which you can see, and you can tell that there were a number of hooks and hoists by the strange-looking windows, which are in the picture. Ah, another interesting building. Um, the building here is at the start of uh, links. Uh, you see on the left hand side uh, the old Nichols Street and you see where the car is, you see Bethelfield uh, Place. Um, the only trouble is, though, of course, like so much of the links, if you go along to see this building now, oh, dear me, it's long since uh, disappeared and, of course, was demolished to allow the widening and the extension of Nickel Street all the way down to the prom. OK, we're, that's us just about finished now. Our final slide... Uh, what you see on uh, the in this picture is that you see the Weems buildings. The Weems buildings were built at the turn of the uh, 20th century. 
and of course that incorporates um, Olympia Arcade. Uh, the behind that building, of course, there was yet another linen works. Um, uh, what you do not see in the picture or, uh, is the Burley Burn. The Burley Burn used to flow down immediately to the right of the Weems buildings. And that, as I have said uh, in a previous slide, is the marks that marked the boundary between Lincoln of Abbots Hall and Kirkcaldy uh, proper. Uh, so we have now reached that final point in our virtual heritage walkabout and I hope you have enjoyed it. Uh, it has been a, let's say, enjoyable experience uh, creating this uh, and we are, as you find know, still experimenting with this. Uh, I would intend to look at um, doing considerable improvements to this one uh, uh, over the next uh, few weeks and republishing. Um, but we're learning lessons all the time. Uh, what we are also, as I said previously, doing is we are working very, very closely with uh, Alec Donald from uh, Kirkcaldy Ramblers, and he is doing such excellent work with uh, creating a range of walks in the Kirkcaldy area and using the app called View Ranger. Uh, so information on that will be made available both on Kirkcaldy Ramblers website and also on Kirkcaldy Civic Society's website and its uh, Facebook page and also on its Twitter feed. But uh, can I uh, say thank you for uh, watching and listening and our next walk will be at the end of June uh, which will be a high street walkabout with, uh, with a bit of a difference. Okay, so we'll see you then.